So this is continuation of part one on the Trinity last week's Sunday, where we belabored the point that God is one being in three persons. One being, three personae. These three personae of God share one single essence, God. And in so clarifying, we condemned the false teaching of Sibelius and Arius and committed to worshiping the triune God with no first and no last. Or as we said in the Athanasian Creed, no greater, no lesser. All three persons of the triune God, co-equal and co-eternal. Article 9 picks up with some scriptural support. In keeping with the theme of the articles, this sermon will largely be proof texting. Now, uh, proof texting means we're finding support throughout scripture for what we believe. If you find that your pastors are proof texting more than exegeting, in other words, if most of our preaching is finding bits and pieces of scripture to prove a point or to prove some theology, rather than reading broader context of scripture and seeing what it is that God has prophesied for his people, what God has spoken through his word to his people. If you find that we're picking bits and pieces of scripture to prove our point on some topic, be concerned. I acknowledged last week that this feels weird, that article 9, with the scriptural support, comes after we've articulated what we believe about the Holy Trinity. This feels weird to me to get to the proof texting stuff after. I'm just getting that out there. But I want to be consistent with the authorship, the arrangement by the authors, Guido de Bray and the rest of the Belgian Confession, that they placed Article 8 first, and then Article 9, the scriptural witness on the Trinity. So we'll begin with, with a section of Article 9. All these things we know from the testimonies of Holy Scripture, as well as from the effects of the persons, especially from those we feel within ourselves. The testimonies of the Holy Scriptures, which teach us to believe in this Holy Trinity, are written in many places in the Old Testament, which need not be enumerated, but only chosen with discretion. I'm getting behind. Sorry. In the book of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, our image, our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Indeed, male and female, he created them. Behold, man has become like one of us. It appears from this that there is plurality of persons within the one single deity. When he says, let us make man in our image, and afterward he indicates the unity when he says, God created. It is true that he does not say here how many persons there are, but what is somewhat obscure to us in the Old Testament is very clear in the New. For when our Lord Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the voice of the Father was heard saying, this is my dear Son. The Son, of course, is seen in the water. And the Holy Spirit appeared in the form of a dove. So, in the baptism of all believers, this form was prescribed by Christ. Baptize all people in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We begin with a proof that this one single essence, this one single being, God, has three persons. It moves away from the creation story to prove this point when it starts talking about Jesus' baptism. I would rather stay there. I would rather stay in the creation narrative to prove that there are three persons present in this one single being. If we stick with creation, we're told in the beginning, the very first words of the Old Testament, God singular, created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the first two verses of the Bible tell us that there are two persons at least present in the creation of our world. Two persons that predate 
predate creation. They are uncreated beings. John, in the very first verse of his gospel, tells us of a third person who's present, predating creation, an uncreated person of the Trinity. It says, very similar to the first verses of Genesis, intentionally chosen by John, in the beginning was the Word. He's talking about Christ. And the Word was with God. And even more so, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So we hear of God, the Spirit, and the Son present and participating in the creation of the world. These three persons of the one being God predate creation, which is why we call them co-eternal. They have always existed in unity. Christ was not created by God when he was born of the virgin. He was begotten before creation, which we confess just this evening. The spirit proceeded from God the Father and God the Son before creation. The Spirit doesn't come into existence at Pentecost. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. We'll continue with Belgic Confession, Article 9. In the Gospel according to Luke, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, the mother of our Lord, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore that Holy One to be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And in another place it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And maybe most clearly, there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. In all these passages, we are fully taught that there are three persons in the one and only divine essence. And although this doctrine surpasses human understanding, we nevertheless believe it now through the word, waiting to know and enjoy it fully in heaven. That kind of closes the book on the understanding. Old Testament and New Testament testifying to the understanding that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in unity and have participated in work together before creation. I want to add a couple of uh, clarifications to address more contemporary challenges. These are challenges that have existed all through Christian history but aren't explicitly addressed in the Belgic Confession, though they had been a problem predating the Belgic Confession, and are a problem in our day and age. Those being, why doesn't Jesus ever claim to be God? You'll hear that one. If Jesus is a member of this Trinity thing, why doesn't he ever claim that in his life and ministry? And the other, the Holy Spirit isn't really a person. It's just the force of God at work. It's what God does. It's sort of like an arm of God. So why doesn't Jesus claim to be God? And the Holy Spirit really isn't a person. Uh, first, anyone who tells you Jesus never claimed to be God has a very limited understanding of what Jesus says in the Gospels. Seven times, Jesus borrows the name for God, the name God gave Moses, I am, ego ami, Seven times Jesus says, ego a mi, I am. Most notably in John 8, 38 and 39. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, ego a mi. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Why would they pick up stones to stone him? Because the understanding of that phrase, ego a mi, the Jews knew and understood what Jesus was saying was, I am one with the Father. I am God. And so they pick up stones to stone him. Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. We have other evidence of this, but it takes a little bit of a historical explanation. So in the 1700s, there's this guy named Granville Sharp, which is a really Smart-sounding name, Granville, I don't know. Granville Sharp. And he's a scholar of, of 
Greek. And so he, he's studying, and he, he comes up with the Granville Sharp rule. He says, any time that the word koi is used, and would be, to, to tie together two adjectives, we always apply it to the same object. And so when we get to texts like Titus 2.13, where Paul writes, while we wait for the, for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, both the words God and Savior apply to the object Jesus Christ. In your King James versions, which are from the 1500s, so it predates the Granville Sharp Rule. King James is a beautiful, wonderful, faithful translation. But they will translate this to our great, to of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. They add another hour in there to separate those two, God and Savior, two different people. Well, Granville Sharp says that's not the way that Greeks would have understood that phrase. God and Savior both apply to Jesus Christ. So in Titus 2.13, here's Paul ascribing Jesus Christ the title God. Peter does the same. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Peter ascribes the title God to Jesus Christ. So not only does Jesus take that upon himself, ego a me, but also both Paul and Peter, John, Matthew in the Gospels, give Jesus the title God. He had clearly reviewed, revealed himself to the people as God. Maybe most clearly in Matthew 26, 63 and 64, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Jesus certainly does claim to be God, and we worship him as such. But what about the Holy Spirit? Is he a person of God, or is he just a force of God in the world? Well, we learn a lot about the Holy Spirit in Scripture, of course. We learn from 1 Corinthians 2.10 that he has a mind, and he's active. He searches all things, even the things of God. Romans 8 picks up on the same theme. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. He's just not an inanimate force, but he has a mind, and he has a will, and he's active. Paul also writes in Romans, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle. The Spirit loves. The Spirit loves. He feels. Not only does he have a mind, but he has feelings. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And then what does he do? The Holy Spirit acts. So he turned and became their enemy, and he hid himself, and he himself fought against them. The Spirit has a mind. He's active. He has feelings. He has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, And these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. The Spirit has a will. Here in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about the different spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit determines by his own volition what gifts he gives each member of the body. The Holy Spirit is not just an inanimate force of God, God's work in the world. The Holy Spirit has character. He has will. He feels. He moves. He has a mind. The Holy Spirit is a person of God. God. Continuing on, Belgic, Belgic, I say Belgical so many times. Belgic Confession, Article 9. Furthermore, we must note the particular works and activity of these three persons in relation to us. Now, here's uh, an area where I struggle because it sounds like heresy to me, uh, but if we understand it rightly, it's not. The Father is called our Creator by reason of His power. Now, what's wrong with that? Is the Father the Creator? Yes. But didn't we just get finished saying that the Spirit was also present at creation? 
and that all things are made through Christ, and without him nothing was made that has been made? Isn't the triune God creator? Or what about this? The Son is our Savior and Redeemer by his blood. But doesn't God save? In the Old Testament, when the Ten Commandments come, doesn't God say, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt? I am your Savior, Rescuer? And isn't the Holy Spirit the one who gives us that inward call and works about justification and sanctification within us? Isn't the Holy Spirit also our Savior and Redeemer? Isn't the triune God our Savior and Redeemer? Or what about this? The Holy Spirit is our sanctifier by his living in our hearts. Doesn't the Word teach and admonish and bring about sanctification in us? Isn't it Romans 1 and 2 that say God reveals his power in creation and puts his law in our hearts that all men might know? So doesn't the triune God participate in our sanctification? Well, of course. Of course the triune God is present in all of this work. But what we have here is actually called the economy of the Trinity, the economic trinity. There are particular roles that one person or another plays a larger part in as it relates to our understanding. The economic trinity, the economy of the trinity. So we can understand and relate to God the Father specially as our creator who gave us an image. We can relate to Jesus the Son specially in his work in redeeming and rescuing at the cross. And we can relate to the Holy Spirit specially in the sense that he lives within us and intercedes on our behalf. And within us works about righteousness and good works. And so we have a special relationship with each person of the Trinity in these roles. Now, taking up that challenge from Pastor Tom last week to be practical, what does something like the economic trinity have to teach us here and now? That word, economic trinity, in its Greek is oikonomia, way beyond my depth here, oikonomia, sure. And it means household management. This is the sort of household duties of the Trinity. Which person plays the primary role in which situation? If you remember la last week, we talked about the, the marriage union, two becoming one, as a, a practical application of what the Trinity demonstrates for us, two people becoming one flesh. Might there be a lesson to learn here about household management? As the male headship in, in a household, are there roles primary to the father and roles primary, primary to the mother? Do both parents have a work in the birth of a child? Sure. Does the mother have a primary work in the birth of a child? Of course. And so on and so forth. There's something to learn about complementarity from the economic trinity, roles that each member of a household plays in relationship to one another, to their children, to their church, to their community. What about in the body of Christ, his church? Might there be roles each one of us are more suited to play? And in a lesson from the trinity, might we be reminded that there's no lesser or no greater. Some of you might have very presentable roles to play if we're taking up that image from 1 Corinthians. You might be a hand or a face. You stand up here, you sing up here, you stand at the welcome center, you play organ, you do this or that, you're a greeter, you're an usher, you're very visible. Some of you might be a little more unpresentable. You're making copies, you're cleaning church at the middle of the night, you're running different aspects of Sunday school where maybe the whole church doesn't see what you're doing. 
But we're told by Paul that those unpresentable parts have special care. No lesser, no greater. The economic trinity is a lesson for the unity of the body. In all our gifts, in all our roles, the parts that we have to play are important and co-equal for the glory of God. And finally, this end from Article 9. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity has always been maintained in the true church from the time of the apostles until the present against Jews, Muslims, and certain false Christian heretics such as Marcion, who taught that the Old Testament God was angry and entirely different from this New Testament God revealed through Jesus. Christian heretics such as Manny, who taught that all deities... This is kind of like universalism. All deities are, are sort of equal, and, and they all lead to the same mountaintop. Christian heretics like Praxius, Sibelius, we talked about last week, and Paul of Samosata, who all taught some form of, of monarchianism. They taught that, that Jesus and the Spirit were lesser forms of God. Praxis taught a form of adoptionism. He said that Jesus was just a man that the deity adopted for a little while to accomplish his purpose on, on earth. He called him his son so that he could do the crucifixion thing, but Jesus wasn't really begotten from the Father. Christian heretics like Arius, who we talked about last week, and others like them who were rightly condemned by the Holy Fathers. And so, in this matter, we willingly accept that the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian, as well as what the ancient fathers decided in agreement with them. We said last week that the Trinity, as a practical matter, is a distinguisher. That salvation depends on a right understanding of who this God is that saves you. One being in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we rightly condemn heresy that would teach otherwise. But I wonder if landing on something like this sort of pulls the rug out from under the lesson the Trinity teaches us about the unity of the body. Where John, John 17 tells us Jesus prayed, Lord, I pray, God, Father, I pray that they might be one just as you and I are one. Jesus prayed that believers might be unified just as he and the Father are unified. Co-equal. Now I wonder if landing on something like, let's get rid of the heresy, pulls the rug out from under that lesson. I want to share something about the church in Ephesus. I maybe have shared here before. I did a whole sermon on it at Brookfield CRC one time. Ephesus is a church that Paul planted... It's thought that he spent more time in Ephesus than anywhere else on his missionary journeys. When he leaves Ephesus for the last time, we read of it in the book of Acts, they do so through tears. And as he goes, he warns them, be steadfast in keeping out those wolves who would destroy the Orthodox Christian teaching. Paul's like final warning to this church is make sure heresy doesn't get in this church. You might know one of the bishops of the church in Ephesus. His name is Timothy. Paul writes two letters to Timothy. And in his letters, especially 2 Timothy, he gives the same warning. Hey, Timothy, leading this church in Ephesus, you got to watch out for these men. And Paul names names. There's a couple guys who are spreading false gospels, and you need to make sure that that does not take root in that church. I love Ephesus too much to see it tarnished by false teaching. Well, one of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation is to the church in Ephesus. This is written probably shortly after Timothy died. And ceased serving as bishop of the church in Ephesus. And so here's what 
Jesus had to say through John to the church in Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Good so far. They've heeded the warnings of Paul and of Timothy. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, your church will die. The warning of Jesus through the Apostle John to this church is, you've done right in keeping out false teachings, but at the expense of the unity of your body. You've forgotten to love one another. You can picture a church who's just bent on getting things correct. And so there's this distrust between everybody who comes in. And there's this nitpicking over every teaching. And I'm not saying we let false teaching come in here. We shouldn't. But let's not be so tarnished in our thinking that we neglect to love one another that we neglect to trust one another, that we neglect grace for one another, that we would neglect the unity of the body. Salvation depends on the right understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. This is important. But there are things that are not. And let's not let those things take away from that example that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has for us as perfect unity. And let's strive for unity here to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray.